Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and I'm glad you're able to join me in this discussion of broken bones and repair, types of fractures. Um, it's an important topic. Uh, inevitably, this is going to happen either to you or someone you know. There's going to be a broken bone. Uh, it's, it's just part of, part of living is um, extending yourself in, in this way in, in which injury is going to take place. But I wanted to, to talk to you first about some osseous tissue, in other words, bone tissue. I think it's fruitful in order to review some of this uh, uh, microscopic structure of bone tissue in order to fully appreciate what happens during fracture and during repair. So I'm glad you're joining me in this conversation. So as you can see here in compact bone under the light microscope, you see these concentric rings. It sort of looks like wood. This is typical uh, bone tissue. And these circles, these units right here are called osteons. And they're basically pretty solid and strong tissue. In between the cells, which are shown here in uh, black, there's uh, a matrix in between the cells. And that matrix is made up of mostly calcium salts and various proteins, which provides rigidity and strength, but also flexibility. And those specialized cells that make up bone tissue are going to be part of the, the repair and uh, process. And so I just wanted to kick that around just for a little bit. Here's a more of a close-up of an osteon. You can notice here that uh, there's a central canal known as a Halbergian canal, and inside there's blood vessels and nerves. And over here you can see bone cells, which are called osteocytes, and they're in their own little um, sort of cribs, if you will, lacuna. And they can actually share uh, pathways between cells in, the, in these uh, hollow canals called cannuliculi, which uh, contain blood vessels. And that's where the cells will exchange nutrients and waste from one another. Here's another picture of this. You can see the compact bone that makes up the perimeter of this typical adult long bone. You can see inside it's hollow in, in what is known as the medullary cavity. And on the outside of the bone, there's a, a thin tissue known as the peri, meaning around, periosteum. And that is divided into uh, an outer layer and an inner layer. And it consists of an outer fibrous layer and cellular layers inside. Now, you may know that the periosteum uh, surrounds uh, the, the bone, but you should also know that it's continuous with tendons, uh, which are connected to muscles. Okay. So what, what's some of the other functions of the periosteum? Well, it isolates bone from the surrounding tissues. It provides uh, a circulatory and nervous supply. For example, you can see here blood vessels are able to penetrate the periosteum right there. And it also participates in bone growth and repair, which is why I'm bringing this up in this conversation. A little bit about the matrix between cells, and this is a really cool scanning electron micrograph of an osteon. Here's the Albergian canal. You may know that the, the matrix, as I mentioned before, is made up of calcium, but it's calcium phosphate. And that reacts with calcium hydroxide, forming crystalline structures, which are very, very dense and rigid, which provide good support for, for bone. It's a very hard connective tissue. And collectively, this is called uh, hydroxyapatite, and there's the molecular formula for that. So hydroxyapatite is making up the calcium uh, portion or hard part of the bone matrix, whereas the other part is made up of a variety of proteins, but mostly collagen. Okay, And this is a thread-like protein, again, scanning electron micrograph, which provides elasticity uh, in the bone, giving it its uh, ability to flex. Now I want to focus in a, a little bit on some bone cells, which, you know, in the end, the, the cells are most important, but they only make up 2% of the bone mass because obviously the, the, the salts and the collagen are going to make up the majority of the mass. But the cells are really important because they lay down the matrix. They're the ones that build the matrix. They're the ones that tear the matrix down. And so I wanted to uh, introduce you to these cells, osteocytes, uh, osteogenic cells, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts. Okay, first off, osteocyte, your typical mature bone cell that's found here in the compact bone, as I mentioned before, in the lacuna. Here's the uh, cannuliculi 
uh, canals that connect osteocytes. And here's the matrix, which is made up of that um, calcium matrix right here, and also protein matrix, oxyapatite. So osteoblasts are mature, immature, I'm sorry, immature cells that will secrete and build bone. Okay, and so they're the ones building bones. And so osteoblasts, you can think of them as bone builders. And as they build bones, the osteoblasts themselves get surrounded by the matrix and they become the osteocytes, which are the mature bone cells. So the osteoblasts are the bone builders. They're the ones that are uh, putting down, well, first what they do is that they put down something, a tissue called osteoid. An osteoid is the unmineralized portion of the bone matrix. And so this is, this is mostly the collagen. And as you can see here, C, right in here, this region right here is mostly collagen matrix right in here, okay? And then the osteoblasts will begin forming bone tissue by secreting osteo osteoid and several specific proteins. Again, I mentioned collagen right in this area. And then ultimately it'll become mineralized. When I say it, meaning the osteoid will become mineralized. In other words, calcium will start to uh, be deposited in the osteoid and it'll develop into mature matrix bone tissue. Here's uh, a picture of the osteoblast itself or the bone building cells of, of, the, of the bone itself. Okay, so osteoblasts, again, uh, you can see them here. You know, obviously this is a drawing of it. This is what they really look like. Here's the nucleus. You could see dark purple right in here. Here's the osteoid. And again, the first thing that they do is put down this collagen matrix and then it'll become mineralized. And then ultimately it'll form um, mature uh, tissue as you can see right here. All right. Now these uh, osteogenitor cells are located in the uh, what's known as the endosteum. Now the endosteum, as opposed to the periosteum, endosteum is lining the medullary cavity of, of a typical long bone right in here. And as you can see, these osteogenic cells right here will uh, assist in fracture repair and they'll eventually divide and produce osteoblasts. And so they're sort of the precursor of an osteoblast. All right. So compact bone is covered with a membrane, this uh, uh, endosteum, <laughs> the cellular layer. And, it, and again, as I mentioned, it lines the medullary cavity and it contains a variety of cells. I've been mentioning uh, osteoblasts, which are the bone builders, the osteogenitor uh, cells, which become osteoblasts. And then there's these cells called osteoclasts, which are going to be uh, degrading uh, the matrix and basically like sort of chewing up the matrix, which in an attempt to release calcium to the bloodstream if that's necessary. So, so all these cells are very important uh, in active bone growth and repair. Let's take a look at those osteoclasts. They're kind of cool. The osteoclasts are large cells and what they do is they secrete acid and acid breaks down calcium and protein and so what's going to happen is the matrix is going to begin to dissolve. And, and osteoclasts uh, are, I would say, one of the easier cells to identify under the light microscope because they're multinucleated. And so there's not a lot of cells that look, that look like that osteoclast. As, as you can see here under the light microscope, here's an osteoclast. It's a pretty large, giant cell. It's multinucleated. It secretes acid and it breaks down the matrix, which releases calcium to the outside. Here's again an animated uh, drawing of, a, of an osteoclast. It dissolves the bone matrix and releases that in a process called osteolysis. In other words, the digestion of, of the tissue. Okay, so collectively, again, you can see that this is in the uh, endiosteum right over here. Uh, you can see the osteoclast is really huge. Here's a uh, a mature osteocyte, which is uh, embedded right in here. Uh, you can also see the osteogenic cells, which are going to differentiate and become the osteoblast cells, which are, again, going to build uh, 
bone by at first putting on osteoid, which is mostly collagen, and then ultimately uh, the calcium salts will develop inside making mature tissue. Okay, so it's a balance. And so this idea of homeostasis is most important. It's a blend of tearing tissue down and rebuilding it. There, and there has to be a balance between it. So you have, again, the bone building cells are the osteoblasts, which are, uh, again, increasing bone density. But then you also have the osteoclast breaking it down. And so if you have more, if you go out of balance, if you have more breakdown, then building, the bones become weak and frail and more uh, successful to, to fracture. Uh, exercise, on the other hand, uh, particularly weight bearing, in other words, like running uh, exercise, causes osteoblasts to build bone, which then strengthens it overall. Okay, so you may know this, just a few uh, tidbits about this, is that human uh, bones are obviously growing when you're in your youth, but they generally stop when you're around age 25. And this concept is known as osteogenesis, in other words, the, the beginning of bone formation. And ossification is a, a topic in and of itself. It's basically what we're, what we're talking about, but there's, uh, there's primary ossification centers and secondary ossification centers in terms of elongating bones. Uh, which is basically the process of growth. And then you have this apocational um, growth, apocational <laughs> growth, which is basically the osteons themselves are becoming thicker as bone grows and the circumference of the lamellae, which are the circular uh, concentric rings of an osteon, uh, become thicker and thicker and thicker, and so the bone becomes enlarged in terms of girth. Um, there's also, at the ends of the bones, areas where the bone is actually growing. Uh, it's, it's the epiphysy line, and it's a, a, it's a, a line of cartilage, and, and it's when bones um, will actually stop growing uh, once it reaches uh, uh, puberty. And so uh, uh, the epithelial, uh, not epithelial, uh, the uh, epiphyseal cartilage will ultimately disappear when bone replaces it. And so you can actually see these uh, uh, epiphyseal lines uh, through an x-ray, and it's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, in a young person, like a teenager, you can see this, and even a, a younger person still. But then when the bone matures and stops growing, the... Uh, the, the, the cavity itself increases, the medullary cavity increases, but ultimately the epiphyseal growth plate um, it no longer forms. And so you can see here, here's the epiphyseal growth plate right in here and right in here. At the end, these are the metacarpal bones. And so you can see the growth plate. So there's still growth needing to occur. This is a, obviously a young person. You can see uh, their, their hand. And then this is an adult. And you can see that the growth plate is no longer uh, appearing. And what's happening is the medullary cavity is starting to increase. And here's the compact bone on the sides. And here you can see the formation of all the carpals in the adult hand. So it's a process of remodeling. Uh, in other words, even though the bone may not be growing in terms of length, it maintains itself. It needs to replace mineral reserves it, it and basically recycles. And so it's a combination of uh, storing calcium, sort of like a bank account. It's storing calcium when uh, times are good in terms of uh, good intake, nutritional intake of calcium. But then when calcium is depleted, uh, the bone can act as a reserve, releasing calcium into the bloodstream. And so that's a complicated process in general, uh, but it does involve hormones and it does involve the building up of bone tier, uh, tissue, osteoblasts, and the degradation of the matrix, which is produced by those multinucleated cells, osteoclasts. And so bone is continuously being remodeled and recycled. That, I find that to be pretty cool. And there, there's uh, the turnover rate uh, will vary. Uh, if uh, decomposition is greater than removal, uh, then the bone will get stronger. Uh, deposition, I meant to say. 
Uh, and if it's removed faster than it's being uh, replaced, then the bones will become weaker. And I think that might be obvious. Okay. And then I mentioned before that there are some factors that will affect this recycling process, which is exercise. And so the more the bone is stressed, the more the osteoblasts will take it upon themselves to produce more and divide and become stronger by laying down more bone tissue. And then again, uh, up to one third of the bone mass can be lost in a few weeks of inactivity. And so this breaking down of bone is of concern, especially in elderly, but it's also a concern just sort of as, as a tangent. It's, it's also a concern in astronauts that are spending a lot of time in, in a weightless environment. And so therefore the bones are not stressed. And so there's a lot of uh, bone breakdown uh, be, as a result of inactivity. But Normal bone growth, I was mentioning, is a combination of hormonal factors and dietary factors. And so obviously, or not, you're going to want to have a good source of calcium and phosphate salts in your diet. Uh, plus, uh, magnesium, fluoride, iron, and manganese. These particular trace minerals are important in bone development, but in particular, calcium. I would recommend taking a look at uh, the labels of, of of various food sources or look it up on the internet which foods contain high concentrations of calcium and look at your daily recommended uh, uh, amounts of calcium. Also it's important to take uh, vitamin C in which needs to be taken in daily since it's water soluble and that's important for protein formation or collagen synthesis and it also stimulates the osteoblasts to differentiate and produce more bone tissue. Vitamin A is also important in stimulating osteoblast activity, and vitamins K and B12 help to synthesize proteins. And so it's a potpourri of nutritional uh, and hormonal factors that are at play. And so a little touch on the hormone, even though this particular video isn't really about uh, the, the concept of the effects of hormones and bone development, but I will throw out Growth hormone, uh, GH, or human growth hormone, is particularly important for this. And also thyroxin, stimulate bone growth. This is produced by the, th uh, by the th uh, thyroid gland, and this is produced by the pituitary gland, growth hormone. Estrogens and uh, androgens, these are male hormones, will also stimulate osteoblast formation. And a combination sort of maintaining homeostasis, a combination of calcitonin, and parathyroid hormones help to regulate calcium and phosphate levels uh, in the bone. So all of those are important. So now finally, after that has been established, let's talk about fractures or basically bone being broken. Now uh, there's different types of fractures. And so this is sort of the, the meat of what this video is intended to be. Uh, and so they, bones can be completely fractured or they can be partially fractured and there's many different types and so let's let's take a walk through the various fractures and so one of the things to consider when you're looking at the characteristics of a fracture is the position of the ends of the bones in a fracture so as you can see here in this uh, drawing there's a fracture here in in the in the radius bone right in here and you can see that the bones are still allied uh, the ends of the bones are still close enough together, whereas um, opposed to that, it would be displaced. This is an example of non-displaced. And so non-displaced is when the bones sort of slide past each other. And as you can see here, this is an example of when, you, when discussing positioning of the fracture, this is displaced, and this would be non-displaced. Now, you can also classify the fracture in terms of completeness completeness. If it's incomplete, in other words, the, the break is not all the way through the bone, it's known as incomplete. Or if it goes all the way through the bones, right in here, again, this is uh, looking at the, the radius and ulna break right in here, uh, this would be a complete break through the bone. Now, the, another way to classify fractures is, is the orientation of the break. In other words, if it's a straight line, you, it would be referred to as a linear fracture and you can see there's a, a linear line fracture here in the in the mandible of, of the jaw the jawbone right in here
It also could be uh, horizontal across the bone or transverse uh, break right in there. Okay, or if the bone, sorry, I apologize for the graphic nature of this picture, but if the, if the fracture uh, is so severe that there's actually penetration of the skin, uh, you can refer to this as either open and closed. It's a, uh, these are uh, compound fractures. The, if the fracture penetrates the skin, it's referred to as open, obviously, and if it doesn't, it's referred to as closed. And so this is an open fracture of the distal end, in other words, uh, furthest away from the body of, of the tibia, right in here, you can see the ankle. So that's, that's pretty brutal right there. Now there's, in addition to the ones I've discussed so far, there's others. And so I'm just going to uh, walk you through these. There we have, I mentioned tra traverse fractures, displaced fractures, but there's compression, there's spiral, the uh, epiphyseal fractures, uh, commutative fractures, green stick, uh, coals and pots fractures. So let's take a look at these. And so I mentioned before that a transverse fracture is a complete fracture, a simple fracture that occurs. It's often due to the, to the tension of, of the bone results in sort of this horizontal break in the bone. Now, I mentioned this before, a little review, displaced fracture, when the ends of the bone sort of pass each other like this. And so the position of the bone is moved. And so some fractures are displaced, some are non-displaced. Now, compression sort of implies what it what the word uh, is, which is a sort of a, a pressing down, and you can see here the, uh, in the spine, uh, in the vertebrae in particular, uh, this is a compression fracture, and it's produced by compression. And so it's squeezing and then fracturing of the bone. Uh, a spiral fracture is the result of the bone sort of twisting and it forms like a little bit of a staircase if you will, a spiral staircase um, and again this is in particular this particular fracture i just wanted to if you don't mind put, throw a personal story my little my little boy bryce uh, was one day jumping in a, in a jumping structure and um, it just he landed the wrong way and bumped into another little guy uh, jumping next to him and as a result of that torsion or twisting force uh, he was, as you can see here, this is a spiral fracture of his tibia. So it was pretty, pretty major. He was out for quite a while. And so a spiral fracture can displace um, uh, the, the bone and, or it could be stable depending on how much force causes it. But basically it's sort of like a staircase kind of, kind of a break. This epiphyseal fracture can be more serious especially if it's you know in, in an area in a young person and it, it breaks up the epiphyseal growth plate when it would really could affect whether or not the tissue is going to continue to grow or not and so that that's an area where uh, there's physicians are more concerned uh, so there it can cause a separation of, of the plate itself the epiphyseal fracture and then this commutative fracture is where the bone is really crushed into more fragments. As you can see here, there's the bone and the humerus right in here is broken into uh, several small pieces or small fragments. And again, you can see this as well. Uh, this is pretty brutal if you ask me. This occurs um, due to high energy force. And so commutative fracture is, is, uh, is major and the bone is just being broken apart into small pieces. And then you have something called the green stick fracture in which um, one side of the bone is broken and the other side is bent. And so, you know, this is a, an example of an incomplete fracture where the bone's bent and the fracture generally occurs this green stick a little bit more common in, in children, which also brings up this, this final one, Cole's fracture. Uh, I mentioned that th this, this is typically... Um, occurs when a person's tripping, a person's falling, and they use their hands uh, in order to brace themselves as a result of um, you know, trying to cushion the fall. And what happens is they break the, the distal, which is furthest away from the body as it, as it articulates with the carpals right here, the distal end of the radius right in here. And that's known as a, a, a Coles fracture. And it's, it's displaced in a backward or a orientation okay and then actually there's one where the pots fracture uh, is the lower part of the 
uh, the fibula, which is right in here, uh, you can notice here that uh, it's a serious injury, uh, and it's basically where the tibia and fibula are articulating again with the ankle bones. It's a lower part of the fibula fracture right in this area. All right, and so the repair process to me is pretty straightforward, and I hope it I hope it is for you. And so if there's a rupture in the bone, obviously that's going to be major damage, and there's going to be a lot of blood loss because there's a lot of blood vessels in there. And so basically we're going to go through a few steps uh, in how to repair a fracture. And of course it's going to involve bleeding, it's going to involve cells, um, building the tissue back up. Okay, and so let's take a look at that process. And so in if you want to categorize it in terms of steps, uh, it it's a good way to organize your thinking on this. But there's a, a fracture or a break in the bone, and uh, it results uh, uh, with bleeding, and then ultimately the blood will form a clot or a hematoma. And so this uh, the fractured hematoma is basically uh, reducing blood loss in the area, and there's a fibrous network uh, uh, of fi fibrinogen turning into fibrin, which is causing the blood to clot, and ultimately uh, there's bone cells that are going to be dying in the area, and this is, you know, the first part of the break is going to be the result of swelling as a result of the hematoma, and it's also severe pain, I might add. Okay, and then what will happen is the cells of the uh, um, endosteum and periosteum will start to migrate into the area, into the fractured zone, if you will, and start to produce calluses. And these calluses are at, basically are internal. And at first, uh, cartilage is put down. As you can see here, there's this cartilage protein material and, and uh, chondrocytes which are the cells of cartilage, will start to form um, this callus internally right in here. And even inside the medullary cavity, calluses will start to form. And the cartilage and bone will start to surround the break right in here. And then ultimately, uh, the cells will become uh, more active and they'll replace the uh, cartilage material with uh, first off spongy bone and then it'll become mineralized and then harden and then eventually on the outside of the bone you might even have this bulge or what's known as an external callus right in here and here's the internal callus and so ultimately the bone is fully capable of repairing itself and you can see it here that the, the point of the callus is that it, it strengthens and stabilizes the break um, and so you can see there was a, there, a break in this particular long bone there. And so finally, I want to talk a little bit about the effects of aging on, uh, on this whole repair skeletal system. And so as again, you may be aware of this, but as a person becomes older and ages, bones become ultimately become thinner and weaker with age. And osteopenia is what we're talking about. Uh, the thinning of the bones usually be, starts in the process surprisingly at a young age between 30 and 40 and it increases as you get older and women will lose up to 8% of their bone mass in every decade men will lose 3% and so you, you have to wonder about the reasons for, for this gender differentiation and it, it's related to hormones but as, as you uh, age um, again what's happening is uh, the the vertebrae in particular are affected by this and jaws and you may result uh, in in the fragility of limbs easier broken bones as you get older and even a reduction believe it or not in height as a result of the tissue being lost in in your spine and this is also sort of related to tooth loss as you're getting older again in in, uh, in the jaw and so uh, the idea of osteoporosis, which is more of a severe bone loss and where this, the, the bone tissue becomes more porous, it literally means bone porous, uh, and it usually affects normal function. Uh, as a result of this, it, it's generally found more commonly in, in women, but it's also found in males as well, and it occurs as women's, women age. And as when you're young, the, the matrix of the bone um, 
is very is very strong and their strong lattice as as you can hear supporting the spongy tissue of the bone but as you age the the tissue itself becomes more porous and and as a result it becomes weaker and more uh, vulnerable to fractures and in particularly in areas like for example in a long bone right below the head and, and where the neck connects and also in the hip so you can get easily fractured and as, and as a result of this um, there can be trouble and, and, and potentially even fatal and so as you age hormones in particular are affecting this bone loss and so estrogens as I mentioned before and androgens help to maintain bone mass but as a woman reaches menopause and these hormones are reduced um, that accelerates bone loss in women in particular and so um, finally another um, important consideration is cancer and so cancer in general are cells that are growing out of control like for example a tumor so a cancerous tissue can can form inside the bone and as a result this cancerous tissue produces an over amount of osteoclast activating factor as a result of that the osteoclasts, if you recall are the ones that that eat the bone matrix and that that stimulates the osteoclast and it produces even more severe osteoporosis as a result of the cancer affecting the, uh, the individual in the bone so in general uh, that was our discussion of review of bone tissue bone bone cells and uh, look at different types of fractures and uh, I hope you enjoyed watching it thanks